Welcome to Ellie Chat. Your home for exclusive news and commentary on the internet's only podcast about candle bin bowling. Brought to you by the Lords of Candlebin, Frank DeLuca and Rich Lamoni. Email the show at alleychat.frankface.net. Now broadcasting from the heart of the Bay State, the host of Alley Chat, Frank Face. Hello, ladies and gents. This is Frank Face, broadcasting from Stoneham, Massachusetts. This is the Alley Chat Podcast, the web's only candlepin bowling podcast. I am joined here, honorably, by Rich Lamoni, my friend, and Kyle Bruce of Classic Candlepins. How are you doing, guys? I'm better now that I hear your voice. Oh, that's very flattering. Wow, you're so friendly. You're not yeah, like that but- on the TV show. You say different things to me when we're off camera. <laughs> I'm such a dick, even on camera, for that matter. <laughs> Okay, so guys, we have an agenda tonight. We're going to be talking. Uh, we got our first text message on our text message line. You can always reach us at 617-863-CHAT. That's C-H-A-T. 617-863-2428. Our first text message comes from a 617 phone number, and they're asking us, what is the toughest house and the uh, easiest house to bowl in, in our opinion? Who wants to start, guys? Well, in, I think in terms of houses that are still in operation, I'd have to go with Georgetown. Uh, that's the toughest house that I've been in. And, um, you know, they was in an operation for many years. They used to have a, a Friday night team many years ago. But I think in terms of houses that are on Friday night, I'd probably have to go with um, probably have to go with Norwood over anyone else. Only okay. been one 400 there, right, this year? I believe so, and that was recent, wasn't it, Rich? Yeah, it was this week, actually. Al Kessick, good job. 401 through a 156 string, you know, in the middle there. So he did very well. You could say that's like a 500 anywhere else. I know. I know. <laughs> I joked about that when I walked in the door. I was like, hey, we had a 500. Well, it was really a 400, but it was Norwood, so it should be a 500. Kyle, do you remember who was on that Georgetown Friday Night League uh, team? Oh, I can't say that I do. All that um, that I can tell you is that in one actually in the first conversation I had with Tom Olsta in preparation for the interview that we had part of the Hall of Fame, they he bowled in a summer league there okay. and he I think the highest score that summer uh there was no fourteen hundred. I think he said that thirteen thirty was the highest score and he had it. But I may have misquoted him. Uh but it's I don't think the plates have been clean there and probably 50 years 13 30 so it was a ten, it was a 10 string summer league yeah yep really yeah that it was that's so, awesome and he, of course he's making the drive from western mass yeah sturbridge somewhere so yep yeah, yeah wow i've never heard of a 10 string league summer league or winter league that's that's a lot of bowling well he's you know <laughs> there were i think there were you know there's a different caliber of bowler uh back then uh, but maybe we're we're heading back to that. We're seeing the five string knockout tournaments, and uh, there's going to be a ten string ten stringer for the next pro series at Lakeside on March the seventh. So yes, yes, anything's Logan. possible. Absolutely. What do you guys think? I, I would say, well, if we're talking Friday night, I mean, I think Norwood is tough. I agree. Uh, I didn't have a problem there. It took me a while to figure it out, and then. You know what I was able to do is I was able to cut shots, so I was able to actually make some spares that I, you know, weren't aren't. They're all makeable. I mean, you have to be lucky too, but I wasn't afraid to hit the head pin and get with get a split. So I know that I think Nord's pretty tough. But if I had to say what a toughest house that I think of, I think of either Viking down in Bridgewater mm. or Wakefield. I think Wakefield is tough as nails. That's what I was going to say. Wakefield's a really tough house, a very enjoyable house to bowl, and it's kind of retro, and they haven't changed a thing in a long in, in in a while. It's very tough, though, as it should be. I yes. think, uh, Real quick, uh, my uncle went to a Channel Five final at uh, Viking in East Bridgewater, and threw six seventy six. And the wow. guy, whoever the person was uh, that was running that shift, said that score should hold up. Hugh Ferguson set a alley record the next shift at 753. 
So my uncle was alternate once again. So if 676 is a pretty good score in times where, you know, you're seeing uh, 100 guys being at a final. I think that says something about that house. Absolutely. I'd have to say, in my opinion, for toughest house, I'd agree with Rich. Wakefield, uh, I also thought Candlewood is pretty tough. I really love bowling at Candlewood. You just really have to hit your shots. It's 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 so tough. Pins really don't slide. Uh, you've got to be right in the pocket, and even sometimes that doesn't work. The pins are just kind of like rocks there. They, you know, There's not much action going on. In terms of the league this year, I've never been to Norwood, so I can't I can't comment on that. I was sick the night that our team bowled. I'd have to say Central Park. Central Park is known; it has a reputation of being tough to bowl at. It's it's really cool to bowl there. It's 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 its own. You 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 step into another world when you're in, when you're at Central Park. But in terms of scoring high, it just doesn't happen very much. Bowling as it should be, bowling as it once was before they started adding in the sidewalls and. Uh, juicing and yes. such, but you know, I, I loved Candlewood. I don't. I didn't find Candlewood hard at all. I was lucky that I found the perfect spot for me at that place, so that I was able to throw the most effective ball, so that I didn't get a bunch of the garbage that people complained about at Candlewood. I was able to get pins moving. So, and what was your secret? I don't have one. I don't know. I just knew the perfect spot to stand and and I don't know. I put good pace on the ball. I didn't really baby it and uh mm-hmm. worked out for me. I mean, I hit some shots and you know, I felt like I threw a fair amount of strikes there which don't seem to happen. Do you think a faster ball works at Kindlewood or a slower ball? I seemed like I thought a faster ball worked okay. better. I mean, I'm trying to think of a slow ball ball. John Starner. Okay. He did not score very well at Candlewood, I felt. Mm. But somebody who throws a little bit harder, like Jeff Walsh, once mm-hmm. you know he came in with Park Place, he bowled great there. Yeah, yeah, he, he did. He did. He throws throws a lot harder than than Starner does, and they're teammates now. They, they absolutely know, they're, they're are they're yeah. teammates yeah. now. They're bowling pretty well this year. There's something to be said for learning. Like I think of Jeff Surrett, of course, learning learning of uh, you know growing up in that house and learning that you really need to hit your spots, hit your head pin, hit the object. And be consistent with that. And if you do that at Candlewood, you can bowl anywhere pretty much. And, you know, I think that speaks volumes to uh, how his career has turned out. Oh, yeah. Jeff is, is proof of that 100%. So let's switch it over to the uh, easiest house. What, what, do we got, what do we think, guys, is the easiest house to bowl at in terms of pin action, scoring, all that fun stuff? Metro Bowl. <laughs> okay. Fair, fair point. <laughs> I, I was expecting to hear that. But... Disagree with you. <laughs> Yeah, I also disagree. <laughs> uh, I'm I was, listening. Metro Bowl is the only candle pin alley in the world where you can throw the same ball ten times and get ten different results. So I think that's so difficult. And I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out to uh, who is it? Uh, Rich Magnarelli on the Woburn Chu Friday Night Team. Mm-hmm. He actually asked me before the season started or right when we started early. He said, "In your opinion." What do you think is the toughest house on Friday night? And I hadn't gone to Norwood yet, so I really didn't have a judgment of that yet. So I said, Metro. And he's like, you kidding me? And he bowls out of Metro. And I said, yeah, Metro. You know, you can throw the same ball and get absolute garbage. I said, and the other thing that I don't appreciate about it is that each lane is completely different. It's like a different house where you go to other places. And if you're on lane one or lane three or lane nine, it's generally the same. It is not the same at Metro. There's not much consistency within the lanes at, at Metro. And I wonder if that you can attribute that to the frequent water damage they have. PBD Square is known to be just a, a, a flood zone. And anytime there's heavy rains or big storms, they're always flooded. They're closed for a couple of days, and they kind of get all the water out, dry it out, air it out. And you can actually see buckles in the lane. Some of them go uphill. Uh, maybe some of them go downhill. But it's really just inconsistent. And, it, you know, sometimes it can get interesting, but also very frustrating. So that's why I kind of disagree with you, Kyle. Well, what would you guys say? For easiest house? Yes. Well, I'm going to have to go with, with home and second home, just because, you know, I bowl well at both of these places. Malden is where I grew up bowling. Absolutely love it. There's great action. A lot of people think it's super fast. I don't know if it's super fast. I think it's in between honest and fast, but... 
I've always scored well there, and I yeah, maybe it's just my confidence there because I grew up there. Uh, secondly, I'm going to say Woburn. A lot of people hate Woburn. They just can't do it. A lot of people think that or say that when they switched from wood to synthetic, it's just not the same house. I never knew it. I never bowled there when it was wood, so I can't say. But I love bowling at Woburn. It's it's. I consider it very similar to Malden. The, you know, even the scoring systems are, are are the same same system, computer system. And I've just always felt comfortable there. I really like Woburn. I mean, a couple of years ago on the Friday Night Pro, I think eight of the ten high singles were thrown at Woburn. Hmm. Before we were Malden, I think it was when we were second year at Candlewood. So that that was my first year, in yeah. the, and that's where that's when, where and when I threw my high single overall. So. I think well, I, I think Malden's fast. I think it's an easy house. I mean, you got to hit the head pin just like everywhere else. But I mean, it's it's easy to if you're throwing a good ball, it's easy to really catch some breaks there. I mean, we saw Chris Capozzi absolutely annihilate lanes twenty one <laughs> and twenty two against us. He had in his first half of the first string and second string, he had a hundred and ninety eight pins. Oh, a hundred half me. and a ninety eight half. We thought, you know, we threw an 1860 and lost all three strings. We threw a 660 first string, lost by, I think, almost 100. They they came in and blew the doors off the place. Capozzi bowled great. I mean, it, you know, that's good for him. That's what did he, he hit, a 460 or something like that that night? Yeah, and our and the guy that bowled against him, John Hendred, threw a 415. Yeah, lost yeah. by 35 <laughs> pins. Imagine Told that. him not to come back. <laughs> that's a nice how do you do. I, I think... The fastest house, and, and I've said this before, is the other Leo's owned house in uh, in Amesbury. Yeah, it I is think lightning that there. place is lightning. I think it's way faster than Metro. I think four seventy six is the high triple there, but they haven't since uh, the Leo family uh, took it over. I don't think they've had a, a team on Friday nights there, and they don't have you know some of the. The big tournaments. I don't think they had a tour there in a while. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if they've had a pro series event there, but uh, I've seen the pin action there. It is absolute insanity. The so th- the thing I love about that place is you just have to generally be in the area. You don't have to be precise, and I, and maybe that's me saying like, oh, I want an easy house. But most of the time, if you're bowling well and you put the ball where it should go. It, the spare should go. The shot should go. And Leo's, more often than not, you get the benefit of the doubt. Where other places, you know, wood goes flying, you miss the pin, stuff like that. I feel like, you know, as long as you're throwing a good ball at Leo's, you are going to score. Yeah, and, I mean, some of the tougher houses, you throw the ball at the, uh, you know, you, bar- you think you buried it in the pocket, but, you know, the pins don't even move and the ball just comes back to you. Uh, down to the approach because, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the pins aren't built to be knocked over. But, uh, yeah, Leo's is the antithesis of that. It's certainly got to be in that conversation. I remember, you know, St. Joe's about 15 or 20 years ago was like that. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. And I know that, the, um, you know, the team that was, uh, you know, the, on the Friday Night Pro League, mm-hmm. uh, won the league at least once there. And, of course, it was stacked. I mean, it was ridiculous. They yeah. would have won anywhere. They would have won at Chuck E. Cheese if they had uh, <laughs> you know, lanes there. Ridiculous. That was what, Carrington, Cookie, Sarge? Sarge. Yeah, Baker, I think, was on that team. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Baker, Unfair. Baker had a ball second on that team at the time. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, you, you walk in the house, you're, you're already losing six just stepping foot on the in the plate, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, it's crazy. Now, I've heard that at St. Joe's, the gutters were a little flat, and they had to, like, flip them over or do something with them so that they're actually, like, normal gutters, and that's why some of the scores were crazy? Yeah, not only that, but it seemed like they went all synthetic, and even the approaches were. And uh, I don't know if that had uh, something to, to play in it, too. I mean, it's just the pin action was ungodly. And the sidewalls, I'm not sure what they were made out of. I mean, they were out of made out of some space-age material that just – you know, allowed you to throw the ball at the seven pin and still get a nine pin drop. So, hmm. how um, many, Kyle? How many lanes at that house? Oh, you would ask. Um, maybe a dozen. Oh, okay, that many? I thought it was around eight or so. I've never mm. been there. It could. I mean, it could have been. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, very long time. I mean, this there's some there's some fast houses out west. Canal is fast. 
mm-hmm. I, I think is fairly fast. I think uh, fun time lanes in Holyoke is, is fast. But you have to throw a good ball. I mean, we were in uh, Richie Myrick throws runs used to run a great tournament there uh, because the house went from 20 lanes to 10. Yeah, they, they... So they used to have a double elimination uh, knockout tournament. And I opened up, we had a team, we, it was, we were going to actually do all of Candlewood, and Frank got hurt, so we had to make some changes. And, Surprise! Yeah, and then uh, and the Jay couldn't bowl, so we got a couple of other guys. So it was three of us from Candlewood at the time. Uh, Justin captained the team, we went there, and I opened up, I was 304 after two. It was like 158, <laughs> 162, or whatever, 164. It was like, it was, pins were flying. This, this was upstairs. Yeah, this was upstairs. I, I I think I had four doubles in the two strings. Mm. I couldn't throw the triple, and the pins were flying. But then when we moved, I threw like a 93. Like, pins just died. So, I mean, I wouldn't call it the fastest house, because things just, all of a sudden, just took a turn and it was the same day it wasn't like I left and came back so I don't know what the difference was and to illustrate how fast the houses are in western mass I remember one and I can't remember the house but one year Jeff Atkins averaged 140 oh my goodness <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that 140? I mean, that's, just, that's ridiculous I've never heard yeah he's uh, got to be the only person know. to do that yeah I would think Wow. I would think but Olsta probably didn't he was like you know, twelve, but yeah, right. right. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, I I remember hearing that about that. It was just crazy. The legend Tommy Elsto. Well, yeah. how, how great was it to meet him that day, guys? Uh, I I thought you guys needed a room. Yeah, it I, was like a boyhood dream come true, and he, he's a really great guy too. Oh, I can't. I still can't get over it. Um, just the time that he gave me and gave the show, and just how down to earth he was, and. Um, all the great stories and there's um, that's the thing about classic candle pins and one of the things that I want to do mm-hmm. and um, I think we all want to do is not only pay homage to the great bowlers of the past but to really get some of those stories and get some of those accounts uh, out in the open and that's something that that Tom did in great detail uh, it's amazing how much has been lost just from the passage of time and yeah there isn't I mean, Candlepin Bowling is a sport that doesn't have documentation. It's not like you can go on Pro Football Reference and see that the you know L.A. Rams went eleven and five in nineteen eighty five after they started nine and zero. Right. Um, you have to rely on newspaper clippings and rely by anecdote and rely on shows like this to pass along that kind of knowledge. Um. What a great game. And obviously so deserving to be in the hall and long overdue. Yeah, I'm surprised it took so long. I think it was just a matter of not being nominated or, or, or whatever. But he ate yeah. it up that day. He loved it. And, and he deserved it. Well, I think That's part it. of it was that he was down in Florida. I think people, you know, people in that circle, from what I gather, it seemed as though like, oh, we're not going to put him in the Hall of Fame because he's not even here in New England anymore. So I don't think it was that. I don't think it was that rich. I think that once you're gone, people can kind of forget about you, even mm. even though you might be the best, you might be great. The way the process is is that someone has to nominate you. It's not like right. you know the Hall of Fame in baseball where you you know you're out five years and then it's basically a done deal. I think that's just how it went down. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, not that people were upset with him, but that he wasn't actually around so i think it was like not the spotlight because he wasn't bowling anymore so the spotlight you know like he was when we saw him on tv Mm. so the spotlight's the wrong word but he wasn't in the fold so it was like well why are we going to nominate you know not that people didn't want to nominate him but there wasn't any focus on him Mm. so maybe it was like out of sight out of mind and i think it worked out perfectly because it was um it was his grandsons that that nominated him yeah and uh, that's to me. That's the best. It really is. Hey, you see that a lot in these. In um, it's you know family. Like we saw, I think Rich Pedroli got nominated by uh, by family. Uh, Dan Murphy, uh, the President's Award. Mm-hmm. We saw his daughter uh, Tanya uh, fly in from out west. You know, it, it's great. But you know, I guess. Oh, plus the other thing is too. You need to wait until you're fifty. That's true too. 
you know, and I think we forget that, you know, one of the stories that Tommy told us is that, you know, he could have won a five final when he was like 14 or something as a, as a pace setter. So he's been around so long that <laughs> it's ridiculous, but uh, pretty amazing. And there, are, I think, you know, there'll be a lot more to come in terms of people that we can talk to. And there's so much to learn and uh, recall and so many great stories to be cherished. I think I agree with you. I think people are kind of wanting those kind of stories to come back. Because they've been missing for so long, you know. Who, who I mean, Channel Five has been gone for what almost twenty years now, right? Ninety six. Yeah, was so, uh, was the last year. And of course, we had a couple other sh- other shows in the meantime. Nothing added up to, to Channel Five. The Bulls were, were maybe just as good, but I think there's that nostalgia that people are looking for, and you know, waking up every Saturday morning and watching bowling with your family. It's just not there anymore. It's there's to me as a kid. I didn't have the talent that you guys had, not even close. But nothing got me more fired up than to hear that song that if I didn't know anything about bowling, oh, I felt yeah. like it would be the uh, the theme music to the Blue Oyster Bar or something. But <laughs> uh, damn. And then the th- I guess the thing that did it for me, Brian Fuller Sr. to me was like Larry Bird mm. because I knew Brian yeah, and I right. knew Jack and I knew these guys. And, you know, when you see a guy like you know, like I knew Mike Sargent, you know, like, sure. You're never going to meet Larry Bird, you know, but I met him <laughs> Well, <laughs> when he yeah. was still playing. Yes. Well, you know, I'm not you. Oh, sorry. God bless you. I but like... I'm just saying, <laughs> generally speaking, to me, those were my guys. And I mean, the stats show uh, the Channel 5 show beating uh, the Sox, Celtics, the Bruins and the ratings. Mm hmm really was uh new england and when you had 200 guys showing up for you know a tournament or a roll-off or you know it's crazy Mm -hmm. times have changed but i mean part of that too is you could actually win some decent money we don't you know classic candlepins and i'm not saying they should but we don't give away 50 dollars for three marks in a row you know so you could bowl great and that starts adding up big time i mean can you imagine you adjust inflation Oh yeah! When they started giving out seven hundred bucks to the winner, that's a thousand bucks now just yeah. to win a match. Yeah, right. I mean, that's like five hundred bucks just to walk in the door with that three fifty. Mm-hmm. You know, the ten grand to win the. I mean, Ulster. How many times was he uh, number one and five grand just to walk through the door at Pilgrim or Sammy White's or uh, oh boy, the fairway. Uh, yeah, I loved Fairway. Oh, that place was great. Great house. I missed that place. Um, who was it? I think it was Jack Quinn that was telling me stories about the Fairway and, or it might have been Olsta, and what that place was like when the Salu family first opened it with the big golf course in the back and such. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was like an amusement park. And then, you know, it finally came down to the to the bowling lanes, but. You know, like you guys said, great house. I thought that place was fairly fast. I uh, Maybe it was another situation where my ball worked well there. but I'd call it an honest house. I really liked it. I went there a couple of times, and, you know, one of my strings out of three would, would, would be upwards of, like, 120, 130. I even threw, like, a 150 there one time. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I only got the ball there a couple of times because when I, you know, came back from college and got back into bowling, I wasn't. I was only going to one place to bowl. I wasn't traveling like I am now. But I was lucky lucky enough to bowl there three or four times or so before they closed. Great house. Well, I would we, I would put I would put Fairway as one of the easiest houses. Really? I, I yeah. I mean and maybe that was easy for me. That doesn't necessarily mean it's easy for everybody. I mean, I think you know I think the Candlewood example is perfect because there were some people that that building would eat eat you alive. And there's other people that would score really well there. I mean, most most people that score really well there score really really well everywhere. So it wasn't really that much of an issue. But I loved Fairway. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there's something to be said for being feeling comfortable in a house. And if you feel comfortable there, you find your spot in the approach, and you know that you're you know with the type of ball that you that you throw, that you're going to get good action in the pocket going Brooklyn or conventional and you'll score there where other people may not. That's just, 
that's just how it is. I mean, I remember John Thomas being on Channel Five, being defending champion, only getting three fifty something to win. Yeah. So I mean, the other times, you know, Jack Quinn, Tom Surrett, well over four hundred for both of them. So it's cyclical. Agreed. I hope that answers the question for the uh, texter, as we've been. I don't think we went in enough detail. Either. Yeah, I think we need to talk thirty more minutes or so. <laughs> oh, well, we can. We there's certainly other, there's can. There's other houses. The New Palace is fast. Well, yeah, I haven't don't, been there. Don't so. say that to them. I mean, I guess it's, it's another place that it just depends on the bowlers. I know, suppose. True. Yeah, I suppose. I, I think there's a lot of action there. Like I said, I've never been there. So I've heard different things that the the, the gutters are not as wide as they should be or the the sidewall and, and, you know, the total width of the sidewall and the plate aren't as wide as they should be. The On, on, on film, the gutters look a little flat. I'll, I'll say that for sure, yeah. you, that you can see that without any debate. Well, that was uh, that was a hot topic, that Billy Palumbo match, as a matter of fact. Oh, because yeah. Because he opened up with the triple, and then he got a mark in the fourth box, and it was a spare, and people were all over him because it was a foul, but the issue was that they filmed it and then recorded, the at the time, they recorded the voice after. So it was accepted as a legal shot. And to to his defense, I was there, and from 65 feet away, it looked good. But then when you watched it on the replay, it looks like the ball came off. But since the, you know, in this situation, it looked like the gutters were kind of shallow, that it didn't look like the ball fell into a channel. So it looked clean. And, I, you know, and people like, he should have just known that it was bad. And, I was, and it was an amazing shot. I, I remember him cutting pins over, and it was... So, it might have been the seven ten with wood, wasn't it? Yeah, it was something like that. It yeah, was, you know, he had a seven fill, so it must have been another pin out there somewhere. But it was a great shot, and you know, from standing there at full speed, you know, it looked good. And then when they zoomed in later and saw the replay, it was bad. But they marked it down as a spare, and he had yeah. to, you know, he had to take it. I agree. Uh, you know, on replay, it certainly looked debatable, but you know, it happened, and good for Billy Palumbo. He threw a one eighty plus on on camera. Yeah. I mean, credit, I mean, it's a hard job to produce a TV show. And oh, yeah. Credit, credit Dave Madela for all the work he's done in, um, you know, putting a show out there. I think they're doing a great job. And now and now they have the King of the Palace belt that you could win if you if you become King of the Palace. It's a wrestling belt. They're really excited about it. It's kind of a cool idea. I've never seen anything like it before. What do you guys think? I'm too fat to wear one. Yeah, that's but, what I uh, said to, to Dennis and Dave when we bowled, uh, bowled against them. I said, Dave or Dennis, what what do we do if I win this? You know, <laughs> did you did you factor my size into, into 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 the belt? And he said, Well, you could just throw it around your shoulder. And I said, Okay, fair enough, Dennis. I can wear it as a bracelet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't know. I I, I don't know what to say about it. Well, okay. they're very excited. Clearly, there was a lot of promotion behind this. Uh, this uh, world heavyweight title belt, and um, God bless the the person that uh, wins it. You don't get to take it home, though, right? No, you it's, don't. It's just a prop. It's just like on on loan, like if you're a Ric Flair or what have you. Yeah, you have to yeah. pay the deposit. Yes, <laughs> nature boy. Yes. All right, so that wraps up our discussion about the text message uh, that we received from the six one seven texter. That was uh, what is the easiest house and the toughest house to bowl at, in our opinion. I think we did a good, pretty good job, guys, with our assessment. Uh, we'll be back with more material. We're going to talk about the Friday Night Pro League right after this. Welcome back, everyone, to Alley Chat, the web's only Kimmelpin Bowling podcast. I am here with Rich Lamoni, my friend, and my other friend, Kyle Bruce. How's it going, guys? I've been upgraded. Upgraded? Yeah, yeah he was, was an acquaintance last episode. Oh, well. Yes. It was just, you know, my friend Rich and this guy, Kyle. He, yeah, he randomly Skyped me, and he said he wanted to do a, a podcast on, yeah. on Kimmelpin Bowling. Right, exactly. And here he is. Welcome. Welcome to you. We're very happy to have you, Kyle. Well, um, welcome. It's good to be had. <laughs> good. So we're going to talk about the Friday Night Pro League, uh, the Northeast Men's Traveling Pro League. Rich, we had a pretty big week this week, meeting uh, Malden 1. 
Yeah, we had a battle. Uh, Ron's Ice Cream, you got to bowl like hell to beat those guys. And uh, they bowled us as tough as humanly possible. When you uh, win a string by eight and then lose one by nine, and you, you know down total is one pin, and you're in the last two boxes of the third string, and it's within single digits. That is uh, where you want to be against every team. Well, no, you want to be in the lead by 50, but... You know, if you're going to have a close match, that's the way to have some fun and, you know, dig for every single pin. And uh, we we prevailed that last string, and we did well. You know, we took a team effort. It did take a team effort, but big shout-out to Jay Simino. Big 411 subbing for us. Yes. Everybody bowled well, but Jay really kind of lit it up. Yeah, he carried us. And we have an upcoming position week. We're actually bowling Ron's Ice Cream again at Ron's Ice Cream. Yeah, we didn't move up in the standings. We needed a sweep. We were uh, entering the night. We were six points behind them. So if we had taken eight, we would have been at home again. But that did not work out in our favor. So we are traveling to Ron's uh, next Friday. Which is not a bad thing because we get ice cream. We do get ice cream. <laughs> yes. That is I think why that factors there. into their uh, their home lane's advantage. I, I would I would agree with that for sure. Team diabetes. It's a, it's a tactic of theirs. Yes, Team correct. diabetes. Yeah. Well, the other good thing too is 20th century will be at home as well against Academy One. So there's going to be a oh, lot. Yeah. Of, there's going to be a lot of good bowling next week. Double at home Ron's match. Ice cream. Who are they bowling again? Academy One. Academy. Okay. Who great. they also faced on Friday. So it, 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 interesting enough, there are two matchups that are consecutive. Team, that are consecutive. Huh. Interesting. Well, that's what position night brings you. So let's start off with the first match of the week. We had Metro Two against Norwood at Norwood. Uh, looks like we had a big kind of a breakthrough or a milestone you could say from for Norwood in Al Kessick. Al Kessick threw a big 156 string and finished with a 130 string for a 401 total at Norwood. I don't know that this has happened this year at Norwood. He was using a 10 pin ball. <laughs> Congratulations to Al Kessick. That that uh we were discussing this before the podcast and it, it you know you could compare that to like a 500 anywhere else. Oh yeah. He throws that perfect smooth Nice and slow ball that you need at Norwood. I found that when when you when you throw hard, you get nothing. So I think Al was the perfect perfect way to get in there and throw some great scores. I mean, even a one fifteen is a good string. Oh you know, yeah, yeah one fifteen is a good string at Norwood. So, in a house that tough, yeah. You know, he he did a, he did a great job. There's nothing you could say about four hundred one. You know, they should he should get an award. <laughs> a nice plaque. Maybe he'll get the podcast award or something for that. I also understand that there was a bit of controversy during that match. Uh, we don't know the full details about it, but we can discuss it here. From what my understanding, uh, in the third string of the match, we were we or they were. It was a pretty close match. In the third string of the match, TJ DePietro ha- was filling a mark on his tenth box. And one of the other team's bowlers, I don't know which one for sure, may have gotten up and during the fill, just before TJ's approach, thrown a ball down the gutter. That's just what we hear via Facebook. We don't know the, the full details. We don't know anything about it, really. But we just wanted to bring it up for as a topic of discussion. Should a grievance be called, if that's the case, Rich? Depending on the closeness of the match or anything? I, I would say yes. I mean, it is a grievable offense. It's definitely unprofessional. It's definitely, you know, it, it didn't affect the outcome of the string itself. Okay. So I don't know what the grievance would actually do. I mean, does it make it so that he doesn't bowl? Does it just a fine? I mean, that's that's the question you really have. What what does the grievance actually accomplish? Well, I guess we could discuss what the punishment is. You know, not punishment, but what the what the discipline is. Do you take points away? Do you, do you fine him, the bowler? Or, or uh, Kyle, what do you think? Well... Uh, to answer Rich's question, I feel like any kind of disciplinary action serves as a deterrent. May not fit into the final outcome of the match, but you don't want anything. You don't want this to happen again. Is what it comes down of to. Uh, because this is the men's traveling pro league on Friday nights. Is uh, as far as leagues are concerned, is the standard bear for candle pin bowling, and it's been that way for the last forty years, if not you know further back. I'd want to make sure it doesn't happen again. You can find uh, that bowler twenty five bucks, but when you're used to paying forty bucks a week, does that really hit you in the wallet? Probably not. You might be inclined to do it again, or mm-hmm. kick a ball return, or foot foul, or lob, say something you know ridiculous sure. to uh, your competition. So I'd be, I'd consider suspension. 
why not? Give him a week off, get him a chance to think about it, and move on from there. Well, the thing with that is it's supposed to be handled by the captain, and then, you know, if a grievance is filed, all the captains are supposed to be contacted. That's one of the requests that I made uh, at the captain's meeting, that if there is a grievance filed ever, that all the captains know about it. I don't have to be on that. You know, they, they take four captains that were not involved in the match to make up a grievance committee along with one member of the uh, board, which would be either the president or the vice president. So, I mean, I don't even have to be on the committee, but just to know that a grievance has been filed, if, if in fact, there is a grievance. Because, you know, what my understanding was there were grievances last year, and then I learned at the captain's meeting that there were none. So, you know, it sounded like people were going to file them, and then it didn't happen, or they didn't email in time, because it's supposed to be done by the next Friday. So, if it's going to happen... Well, we'll see, but it has to be taken up by the by the captain of Metro, which would be TJ, if he's going to do that. But I don't like I said, I don't know what it would accomplish. And he has until Friday to do that. Yeah. Okay. It's hard to say if cooler heads prevail or that there's just poor communication within the game, which it, it's possible. It, it could be possible that both things happen. I think this is an interesting story. I'd like to hear more about it, hopefully on our show, and shed some light on it and maybe get some answers, perhaps. Perhaps people will be listening to the show and they'll want to discuss it. You can contact us here at Alley Chat via text message. The phone number for that is 617-863-CHAT. That's C-H-A-T. 617-863-2428 for the text line and you can also leave a voicemail too remember that if you do leave a voicemail we may or may not play it on on the show so that we can allow our viewers to hear what you're inquiring about so always get in touch with us we love our listeners and we always want your feedback so let's move on to the next match of the night uh friday which was week 24 i forgot to mention that we had metro one at malden two we we witnessed this match Metro 1 took six points against Malden 2. In this match, we had uh, some pretty high-scoring games. Dennis Nuzzo threw a big 162 game. Uh, you saw that, Rich, didn't you? Yeah, he was bowling well. And I, I, my understanding is it could have been even higher. I think he, he blew a shot in the ninth box, and they were giving him all sorts of grief, and then he came right back with a strike in the tenth. Right. So I think it would have been a, a you know good fill, and you know he could have pushed that to the 180s if he you know, kept going. Mm-hmm. So uh, good, good for Dennis. I mean, it t- took two, that was the key to the two points that they took. Yeah, you know, but he, he got some help from Bobby Darty Jr. and threw a one thirty two, and and Madela chipped in with a one twenty six. So, you know, they had some some good scoring throughout the lineup. They did indeed, and and for for Metro One, it was really good to see Matty Penko back on the lanes. Uh, I know he ha- is not bowling full time this year, and I hadn't seen him bowl in a, while, bowl in a while. Matt's a great guy. Just you know, always a pleasure to watch him bowl. He's great. Fun to watch. He pins explode when he hits the pocket. Uh, he's really good at cutting shots. I he think, is. I think. I feel like he's almost better at cutting a shot than he is at like two pinners. I feel like it, you know, it's just like he's got that skill that's just so high in that regard that it makes it so that his, you know, picks up two pinners and singles, and it, you know he hits cross shots so much, so frequently. That you, it's lost on the on the normal easy shots. Right, I've seen him bowl well everywhere he goes. I One over five hundred triple too, right? Yes, yes, he yes. is. Uh, well over five hundred, isn't it? Um, it five might be ten, a something yeah, like that. Yeah. Metro. Yeah, yeah, I remember he was in the paper for it. So yes, good to see Matty this. bowling again. Uh, and that I, was nice because the lights weren't on, so it didn't count. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, at Metro. <laughs> that's uh, that's just a sham. Yeah. But, but he, you know, guy bowls that well, he's not going to foul. He knows not to go over the foul line. I know that for sure. Well, he's six seven, so he can't crouch. So he's definitely <laughs> a stand up bowler. That's for sure. Yeah, that is true. With the Afro six nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, our next match for the week was our match. Uh, Ron's Ice Cream was visiting us at Malden One. We took six from them. Uh, they bowled very, very tough. It was not an easy match. Like I said, Jay Simino kind of carried us with a, a big four eleven. Um, Jay Shiner, big three sixty six, and Bobby Darty Senior three sixty. Rich you had a three forty nine. Um, you were pretty consistent most of the night. Yeah, I had a little trouble during the third string finding the head pin, but uh, I was able to make my shots. And and you know it's frustrating because I was all over at the first two. I felt like I was bowling really well. I mean, I didn't score as much as I would have liked, considering the number of times I hit the head pin. 
Um, I did have some some leaves that were less than desirable, but I do know that I had some trouble in the third string, and uh, you know I was able to bail out with a good good mark in the tenth box. Uh, I made the six seven, which was nice because Nick Norcross opposite me had a relatively easy um, spare that he could make. I know that there was a piece of wood that was could have been a roadblock, but he was able to get around it and make the shot. And uh, the match was extremely close at that point. And not getting a mark opposite him, you know, where I was on the left lane, would have been very detrimental to us because we would have been losing by double digits at that point after right. his fill. So I was able to keep it even because he got an eight fill and I got an eight fill. So nothing changed, you know. So that ended up being a pretty important fill because then Bobby and Jay went crazy. They did in the next two boxes, and then all of a sudden we were up over twenty. Okay, so and uh, speaking of Nick Norcross, I I drove him home on Friday night, and he tells me that he has around 200 or so episodes of Channel 5 on VHS that he did not seem willing to convert over to digital format. So we may have to have a discussion with him, Kyle. Well, I can certainly help convert them. Yeah. Why is he unwilling to uh, do that? He just didn't seem to want to invest the time in it, which I can understand that, you know, there's a lot of time involved. And I think he was a little possessive of his tapes. Understandably so. Well, if there's over 200, that would... If they're assuming they're recorded by uh, EP or SLP, those are six-hour tapes, so it would be about roughly 35, and you know, I have all the time in the world. I have all the time in the world for you, Nick. I'll be happy to you know, review your tapes. No, well, no campfires, Nick. No Chinese food. <laughs> no Hooters. No Mai Forget Tais. No, yes, no Mai Tais. No rides. <laughs> Forget it. Take the train. So we're going to have, you heard it here, Nick, right on, on Alley Chat, the podcast. We're going to have to talk to you about converting those tapes over. Because, uh, as we were saying in our last segment, perhaps there's a lack of communication in the Canopin world. And I think we need to kind of remedy that because people are looking for more material from the past. No question. Yes. Throwing the gauntlet down. You're on the hook, Nick. Yes. More like an olive branch of please, instead of throwing the gauntlet. <laughs> please. Well. I'm a man of evil. Please, sir, I can suppose. we have some more bowling? Evil, Please, Kyle. Sir. I have never heard your evil voice. You have not? <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like, uh, I don't know, I'm about to do a Nissan commercial or something. Yes, Kyle Bruce. The new Maxima. <laughs> Comfy. Thank you for that, Kyle. That's fantastic. So, My pleasure. Okay, back to Friday night matches. Uh, next match, Academy 1 was at 20th Century. A couple of 400s here. Rich Moran started huge, 172 string. Bobby Witt for 20th Century threw a 14, 416 total. Uh, looks like 20th Century took six points against Academy 1. What do you expect out of these? I mean, is this this is pretty much up to par for, for both of these teams, right? Well, you know, got to give credit where credit is due and a 172 at 20th century where the house has been falling pretty tough for yes. everybody that's just wow I want to high five Rich Moran next time I see him and yeah. say you know you must have had a, a hidden dwarf back there knocking over extra pins for you because they don't seem to fall for anyone else so I mean <laughs> good for, you know good for you and, and you know they won that string by three so they needed every single one of those 172 pins yes indeed in order to take the string so I mean that, that let them escape with two points. Yeah, they made you know, all the difference. You're going to consider that a win. You know, you get two out of that with a, you know, 6-17 is a good score for a team. You look over the other side, and there's just consistency across the board. I mean, 6-14, 6-35, 6-24. Those are, those are, those are going to win you strings every week. You know, unless you go to Lockheed. Because, you know, they average 6-24. So, you right. know, you're looking at a split and a loss right there. So, you know, there would be five points, which is a good would be good, you know, they they are six twenty four bowlers so unbelievable but you know nice to see twentieth century bowl well at home because I know that they have been struggling there yes they're doing wonderfully they always they do wonderfully, wonderfully. Yeah. yeah yeah so okay uh, moving on we have Riverwalk visiting Lucky Strike Lanes Riverwalk took two points against Lucky that's in my opinion that's kind of expected what would what would you guys say. Um, I suppose. I mean, Lucky is, you know, they're having the best year uh, so far. Mm -hmm. They're loaded. Um, well, yeah. There's, there's really no, you know, weak link, I suppose, with uh, Boudreaux and Surratt and Barber and such. Um, Riverwalk did get good nights from Steve Plant through 389. Uh, Richie Ho-Hom, 383. 
they got a 665 third string, which yeah. is, uh, you know, it, you can't argue with that. But being on the road against Lucky, um, who threw 1891, uh, you got to bring it uh, against those guys. It doesn't yeah. matter where you are. Yeah, I mean, so, their, their lowest score was a 362. That's tough to compete with, really, on any night in any yeah. house. Yeah, and I like how you refer to, to Sean Baker and Sean McKinley as as, as such. Yeah, that's a good such to have, as you know. You you mentioned Boudreaux, Baker, and Surrett, and such. I mean, I'm sorry, Boudreaux, Barber, and Surrett, and such. Well, but that's a good you know, pair. They're a great uh, doubles team too. Oh, they, they are. They bowl so fierce. I love to watch and the them pro series. Yeah, awesome. they're great. But that's, you know, I mean, good job for Riverwalk and Keith. Keith's a great. Is it Digio? Keith Digio. Yes. Digio. He's a, he's a great bowler in his own right. But you know, you you wonder how does he fit in with those guys? It's you know. Not that there wouldn't be chemistry, but it's not Peter Crawford. So if Peter's in there, maybe they bowl differently because mm-hmm. he's you know the normal the normal guy. I mean, I think Mookie's bowling uh, the road matches for Riverwalk, and uh, Peter's bowling the home matches. I could be wrong, uh, as I often am, but that's uh, that's my uh, thought process as, as it involves Riverwalk. Do you know why they're doing that? I don't. Uh, I know that Peter has a uh, a drive because I think he lives in Lemonster. Yeah, somewhere out there. So, uh, yeah, it is out there. And, of course, uh, Keith lives, I believe, no, he lives in Georgetown now. Okay. But he's, you know, been part of Amesbury, you know. You know, I think he works for the fire department there. And he's been around forever. Actually, I think he's the one that has the house record at Leo's. Okay. Uh, for three strings. And he's been on, I know he was on, you know, TV many times. Many and, times. Yeah, he's capable of uh, a big number yep. um, any night. So, um, you know, the thing about Peter is that I think he had a slow start this year, but he's really rebounded and he's, you know, young kid, throws a great ball. Oh, he does. Uh, you know, big numbers out of him. And, you know, Riverwalk is a, a team, you know, you make the playoffs, you know, you just don't know. That's why they have playoffs. Absolutely. Yep. And the thing, too, you know, Surrett, good job. Two weeks in a row, 400. Makes it even better because he bounced back from a 330 at Norwood prior to that. You know, Norwood and, made him a better bowler. Well, I think – I don't think Jeff's bowling as much this year. And when you're bowling 190 a week, um, it can be tough. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when he starts getting on a roll, I mean – they're going to be very tough to beat, obviously. Of course. And uh, but again, you never know. It's the playoffs. You don't. I mean, you can win the whole thing. You get your own money for winning the you know the regular season. But come playoff time, you can't take anybody lightly because anyone can have a big night. Absolutely, that is true. You know, I remember there was a post on the Kaliri forum. Uh, there was a poll about Jeff, and the question was, "Is Jeff going to throw his ninth four hundred in a row on Friday night?" He had eight in a row. This was a few years ago. I wasn't bowling on Friday night at that point. Um, I think most of the people voted yes. It seemed like the safe bet at the time. I don't. I don't know if he did it or not. You know, that but, must have been when he was bowling for Candlewood. And Rich, what what what, what was the the Caleri forum? Explain that to us. It was a forum for the bowlers. Um, named after. Named after Bob Caleri. The one and only Bob Caleri. The one and only Future Bob HOF. Are you going to nominate him, Frank? <laughs> Perhaps. I love Bobby Caleri. Come Bobby's on. Bobby's great. But uh, it was a forum that you could post upcoming tournaments. There was stuff for the Pro Series on there. Uh, it was frequented by probably, what, 98% bowlers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was it was a good informational area. And, you know, there were discussions on Friday nights and there was, you know, rule changes and you could bring them up there and then people could respond at their own leisure as opposed to having everyone in a room all at once. And, Rich, now that that's been taken down, it's gone, where can people go to do that? What forum? Yeah. Well, we have a forum up and running uh, on my site, uh, everythingcandlepin.com. If you uh, create a username and with a password, you can get in and you can do the same type of thing that we did on the Clary forum. We have uh, information about house leagues and tournaments upcoming. It hasn't gotten the traffic that we would have liked at the time, but uh, we're hoping that this will aid it. And I'm writing more, so hopefully we can get back into getting people driven to this site in order to get uh, as much bowling information out there to people. Very good. So check out Rich's blog at everythingcandlepin.com. 
All right. Uh, our next match is Woburn 2 at Academy 3. Uh, Woburn 2 took two off of Academy 3. So uh, Academy uh, escaped with six there. Academy was at home and... Joe Smith showed up. He threw he a 380. Big 380 well. from Joe Smith. Uh, well, you'd expect that from Joe. He's, yeah. He bowls awesome everywhere. Um, I talked to Kaz. Uh, we bowled together on Sunday up at Park Place, and he said that the place was uh, it just brutal. Hmm. It was falling real tough. For, and, I mean, look at the scores. I mean, you know, you don't want to single anyone out, but you got, you know, Mark Gregory with a 97. And, yeah. And there was some tough pins that night. You know, you throw a 1675 and win six, you should be, you should be happy. Sure. So, I mean, I don't think that's... That's like normal academy in that room, you know. Um, I've never been a fan of the lanes that Academy Three bowls on. They bowl on lane three and four in the hmm. in the left room. I struggle over there for some reason. I don't know. I didn't bowl well when we bowled against Academy. Uh, I've bowled well on lanes seven and eight and eleven and twelve against yes. Academy Two and Academy One. So you know, you got to take your lump sometimes. It's it's interesting how it's just a that left room is such a different spot than the entire rest of the building. Yeah. You could even say that's an entirely different house. Absolutely. 100%. I loved bowling in the middle room. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean... Yeah, it was good. Pins were moving pretty good. You had to hit your shots just like any other place. You had to hit the head pin just like any other place. You know, but uh, you got some good benefits if you hit the head pin there. Yeah, and perhaps the atmosphere added to that, too. Oh, yeah, of course. We were bowling in the worlds. Come on. Yeah. There's no better stage than that. So... Okay, so our next match uh, is the final match of the week. We have Woburn 1 at Central. Eddie Woodside, a big 403. Uh, the fact that it's Central Park Lanes doesn't seem to phase him. It never has. Uh, he finished with a 162 string. It looks like we had a sub for, for Woburn 1, John Blaze. That name has come up before, Rich. Yes, it uh, has. As of recent, he bowled with Tina Ward in the doubles at Lita, the Pro Series doubles, uh, doubles tournament, and... This kid, you know, he's he's I understand he's young. He's coming out of nowhere, but he's he's popping up everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, he bowled in the singles event at Park Place as well. And uh he told me that uh he was in Virginia for now we've come to find out that it was because he was in school. Oh, uh, okay. So he's back from from school. So he, so he is he's, young. Uh, he's then. getting okay. back into bowling it looks like and uh good for him. I mean, 364 as a sub is, you know, that's great. That's, yeah, you know that's what you you want. You, he's going to get noticed that way. He was their high man, high man for the night, and especially the, on the road too. Oh yeah, well, and to add to that, especially at Central. Yeah, very tough place to bowl. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he's ever set foot in there before. May or may not have. Yeah, yeah. you're right. So, uh, Central Park Lanes uh, ended up taking eight points against Woburn One. So uh, let's talk about the standings. We now are up to Lucky Strike. They have 155 points. Uh, they're they're nine ahead of Central Park, so they can't be caught within a week's time. Academy three is one forty five. Academy two one forty two. That's your top four. Five through twelve, uh, we have at fifth place twentieth century one twenty four. Academy one is at one hundred fifteen points. Ron's ice cream, who we're bowling against next week, is one hundred five. We Malden one are one hundred three. Metro two is in even hundred points. Riverwalk is at ninety four. Metro 1 is 87, Norwood at 73 in 12th place. 13 through 15 is Woburn 2 at 61 points. Malden 2 is at 44, and Woburn 1 is at 34. And this is interesting because we now have a position week coming up, which is something I think uh, is pretty is new to this year. Uh, it may have happened in the past, but because we've had 15 teams, we do have a bye and we do have a position week. So upcoming uh for this week the 27th friday night we have central at lucky so that's one verse two uh the academy two is at academy three that's basically a home match for for the two teams academy one will be uh bowling beside us at 20th century against the the, the 20th century guys we malden one are at ron's ice cream who we bowled this this past week riverwalk will be bowling at metro two and Norwood will be against Metro at uh, Metro One at Metro. Malden Two is at Woburn. Woburn One. The way this works, because it's in, in in uneven amount of teams, is thirteen bowls against fourteen, and fourteen bowls against or fifteen rather bowls against fourteen scores. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. So it's kind of a new system. Kyle, have you ever seen anything like the, like this in the Friday Pro League? As far as position matches go, well, the 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 fourteen and fifteen teams. Um, no, I, I think it's been a while since at least 
as far back as I've been watching it. Sure. I, 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 normally, they there hasn't been an uneven uh, number. I think there was uh, one one year, a few years back, where they had eleven. Okay, pretty sure. But, I'm pretty sure Mark told me it was nine. Actually, Mark okay. Ricci, I think he said it was nine. And he said that they did it the same way, that the ninth team would bowl against the eighth team's score. But it wasn't, I think it was like seven or eight years ago? Yeah, I, th- I think it's it might been, have a, been a little while. further back than that. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, what they've done, the format, is really the best you can do with that for- with, with that amount of teams. Yeah, you'd have to divide the points some way to make it otherwise. Because you have to somehow make 16 points for those three teams. So that seems to be the best way to do it. I mean, I haven't come up with a better way. Well, you know my math, Rich. That would confuse the hell out of me. So right. it's probably best not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, guys. Any further comments on this week of the Friday Pro League? Ron's is going down? I don't know. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's All hope. Right. Um, there are some great matches out there. I mean, you know, this. I love the fact that I'm bowling on Friday night, but I also wish that I could take a trip to Lucky and watch the Central Lucky match because I think it would be awesome that – you know, the Academy 2 team is bowling out of this world, and I'd love to see them face off with Academy 3, but, mm. you know, uh, I have my own match to go to, and I'm going to get ice cream, where, you know, Lucky and Academy 3 do not have ice cream. So, better for me. Well, Rich, is that paleo ice cream? I don't care. <laughs> paleo. Does not matter. <laughs> okay, you can make an exception? Yes. Very good. Well, c- Wait. I can make an exception because my wife has already made the exception of we're having ice cream. Oh, okay. Kind of put her foot down, actually. Happy wife. Yeah. Happy Happy life. life. Yes, I know. We all know the same. Yeah. God bless her. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You weren't complaining when you were eating the paleo cookies a few minutes ago. Hey, I'd have no problem with paleo. Damn it. All right, folks. Well, that wraps up our coverage of the Friday Pro League, week 24. Next episode, we'll be talking about the New England knockout bracket run by Nick Zaffalato. Check us out on our website at allychat.frankface.net. Leave us a voicemail or a text at 617-863-CHAT, 617-863-2428, and search for us now on iTunes. For my co-host, Rich Lamoni and Kyle Bruce, this is Frank Face. Thanks for listening to Alley Chat. (laughs) 